research projects also. Sir, areas of general interest include alternative dispute resolution, human rights, international humanitarian law, and refugee law. His current research interest includes international commercial arbitration, investment arbitration, and mediation in commercial matters. Sir has authored two books. First book is on issues on arbitration, and the second book is on judicial approach in criminal justice system and experience of India. Along with this, Sir has many research papers and articles published in international and national journals to his credit. Dr. Vikas Gandhi has been invited as a resource person, speaker, and moot court external examiner in many institute of repute. Sir has delivered lectures in National Judicial Academy and Gujarat Judicial Academy and judged Inter-American Human Rights Moot Court Competition. Sir has been awarded fellowship by Asian Law Institute also. We welcome you to the Department of Law PIMR. Now I request our distinguished guest to address the gathering and to give his precious inputs on today's topic. Welcome, sir. Sir, you need to unmute. Thank you. Uh, at the outset, uh, let me thank uh, uh, to the PIMR Institute, uh, that's a department of law, who has uh, inbuilt an idea about to discuss something on uh, the issues which might influence on post COVID 19. It means that at the division, uh, the situation pre-COVID-19, we understand the different subjects in a different way. And uh, post-COVID-19, uh, it is possible uh, that in future, the subject may see in a different context altogether. Uh, I have written intentionally a few names who constantly, uh, you know, approached me for organizing this uh, event. And that's the faculty development program. And I'm very conscious when I'm reading. And when I say it's a faculty development program, it's not a webinar. Professor uh, Deepa Srivastava, I thank. Uh, Ritu Priya, Professor uh, Nakul Singh, I think is in principal or uh, HOD uh, of the Institute. Uh, continuously, you know, keep taken pain by uh, Gopal Kag, Saili and Nishant Joshi. And uh, the student convener also, because uh, we generally, as a faculty, uh, we, we, we organize such programs based on uh, or completely relied on uh, the students' uh, active participation. So, uh, student convener Anjali and then uh, Vimleshwar Chaturvedi. Uh, I thank to all an entire group who has uh, taken pain since last one month. I know exactly the last month and around 25th or 26th of June, I received the call. Okay, now come uh, to the subject because uh, I was happy at the time uh, when it has been written, the timings, 4.30 p.m. onwards. So I was so happy. The day before yesterday, uh, I received it, it's at about uh, 5.30, so till 5.30. Uh, so just remind me when I uh, cross my time limits given to me, so I can uh, conclude accordingly. Uh, okay, uh, now come to the uh, academics. Uh, come to the academics now. I'm sharing. Uh, okay, uh, host disabled to participate screen sharing. And uh, uh, should I share? Uh, my screen? No, no I'll, I'll, I'll share a PPT. You just yeah, PPT. PPT. One more minute, right? and I'll do it for you. Okay, okay. Can you go with the PPT upload? Yeah, it's perfectly fine for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, there are there are two words, uh, uh, colleagues. You can see here. I will go slow. Uh, I understand that we all know about the arbitration proceedings, how it's generally conducted. Uh, my major focus would be on uh, how it's going to affect 
uh, in post covid 19 um, and the uh, two distinguished words which i have written on the slides that is one is uh, proceeding and second is process and both have a different meaning uh, if I go with the, uh, the, the distinction between these two words, which you can see and read on proceedings, on slides on proceedings. Proceedings means that skeleton. Uh, we can see proceedings in the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996, uh, first 36 sections, that is called proceedings. In layman's understanding, the proceedings means that how the arbitration would be conducted, arbitration would be conducted irrespective of whether it's a so-called international commercial arbitration or a domestic arbitration. And it means that uh, uh, if, if I bifurcate further, uh, in uh, how do I distinguish the EICA, that's the International Commercial Arbitration, and a domestic arbitration, a uh, one thing that we have to keep in mind, and that is about that if uh, the parties to the International Commercial Arbitration, uh, if one of the parties is other than Indian party, then it would be considered as an ICA. If both the parties are of any of the nationalists. You can say if we are from India, we can say that both are Indian parties, then that arbitration proceedings would be considered as a domestic arbitration. So we should not confuse on that particular arena uh, where we can say that what do you mean by uh, proceedings and international commercial arbitration proceedings? And on second hand, domestic uh, commercial arbitration proceedings. So we have a definition based on the ancestral model law, right? That's you know very well, I know. Uh, and that's a very party centric definition so far as the ICA and the domestic arbitration is concerned. And what I said, the proceedings means, proceedings means the provisions which we can find into the 1996 act now come to the practical arena what we find generally in the act we find generally in the act it's about uh, how to appoint an arbitrator we can find the definition of arbitration uh, we can find that who is going to appoint an arbitrator we can find once the arbitrator appointed uh, interim order can be passed by an arbitrator or not uh, then we can say about the jurisdiction, whether the arbitrator has or not on the subject matter. Then we can say that arbitrator then sending a notice to both the parties to start the arbitration proceedings, then claim from one party, then written statement from other party. Then you can say the evidence would be followed. And it says that uh, the procedure of the civil procedure code and then evidence it's not binding i'm not saying it's not applying but i say it's not binding and then the award passed and then award may be challenged uh, that is under section 34 uh, if it's going to be uh, enforced then that would be under section 36 it's going to be enforced so altogether what i said just now by referring different provisions of the 1996 act is nothing but proceedings it means that uh, uh, we know that this is a proceedings now the question arises why do we much more conscious or requires to be conscious as a faculty also that about the arbitration let me give you a practical answer of this uh, uh, uh there are many professors in NLUs that you may find they apart from their own regular teaching assignments and the research assignments which they have taken up or research projects which they have taken up with the different uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations uh, majority concentration uh, generally you may find it's about consultancy 
and consultancy is uh, is an area uh, where you can uh, give your knowledge expertise advice uh, to the different sectors right and different firms uh, different companies also so in a similar way arbitration is a subject uh, where we can uh, we can move ahead for the consultancy programs uh, over and above our regular assignments of teaching uh, and research and that's why in today's era uh, uh, arbitration is much more important and specifically uh, uh, after the situation uh, uh, will take a few drawbacks as well that we will discuss once we go uh, once we go in detail uh, proceedings proceedings about the arbitration right so uh, the first is that about proceedings that you know this is proceedings now the second word which you can see here on the process which i have written on the slide process is different than proceedings process it means that once the arbitration proceedings initiated and when arbitration proceedings will initiate arbitration proceedings will initiate when you have a then the party or you as a party has appointed an arbitrator and on a first occasion the arbitrator is inviting a conference or you can say inviting both the parties so at the moment when the arbitrator or a tribunal sends a notice that a notice sending and time period giving by an arbitrator is not a part of the proceedings it's a part of the process so if i say that if you are an arbitrator for example you have been appointed as an arbitrator by both the parties your first step right that is to call for a conference that is a joint meeting and before that you are issuing a summons to both the parties or a notice to both the parties by saying that since both the parties since both the parties i have agreed you to act sir we should have a conform schedule how the, the arbitration arbitration proceedings will continue when you are giving a time limit that within a week that uh, the arbitral tribunal expects uh, within a week arbitration tribunal expects something right that response from the parties on the notice that is a process so you may find a distinction between these two words ordinarily uh, if if we see the same distinction that is in the civil procedure code i am just giving you an idea you can think on by your own and then come back with the questions to me i i appreciate it what i say is, is uh, what i say is, is uh, if in civil procedure code if we are reading the principles right that is the sections right uh, that section covers entire proceedings but when we go with the orders and the rules that is nothing but the process so if i have to if i have to take evidence as an arbitrator for example right i'm taking evidence as an arbitrator that is a proceedings under the provision of the arbitration and conciliation act 1996 but i'm taking an evidence based on the parties agreed on the procedure to take evidence that is the civil law countries has a different object and the purpose and intention and different method to uh, to take up the evidences so that evidence procedure right how the arbitrator would take evidence that is a process right so there is a clear distinction um, between these two words which i have written here that is the proceedings and a uh, process right i hope that uh, so far as this point is concerned uh, it is clear uh, i request to go to the second slide please okay now this is something which is very important uh, for all of us 
Uh, let me go through it. You ever thought of any time, any point of time, I never thought of such kind of things, uh, whether the present situation can influence to an arbitration process. My question is not about arbitration procedure, which I made you distinguish and you are now clear, I hope so. So now the first question is that whether arbitration process, right, would going to be changed after the COVID-19 situation. And how do I say, what was the situation pre-COVID-19? Unless I understand that situation, I cannot make any comment on that whether the arbitration process is going to be changed after this COVID-19 situation. Because still we are under the COVID-19 procedure. We still we are in that stage. But, but uh, 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 we as an academician, uh, cannot give a proper answer to that question, which I feel it, unless, unless, unless we have experience to act as an arbitrator, unless we have uh, become in witnesses somewhere in the arbitration process, uh, unless we, uh, uh, we have a consultancy and we are, we are giving an advice to the tribunals, unless that experience uh, would be very difficult for us to give any comment on that whether um, uh, uh, the present situation can influence to an arbitration process and can change entirely or maybe partially uh, the arbitration process in future. That's why I've written two things here. I think this can be decided by an arbitrator, counsel, witnesses, experts, third parties, yeah, probably, or those who are indirectly uh, in process. Who are indirectly in the process? Every word you should understand. Indirectly, if I'm a witness, I'm indirectly associated with it. If I am a third party, I am indirectly in associated with. It. Now, one small clarity here. Third party does not mean what we generally see into the civil procedure code. Here, third party uh, generally concentrates on third party funding issues. Uh, and that's generally in the investment arbitration. So what happens that I'm just giving an example to make you more understand and uh, deep understanding. Uh, for example, uh, if I am running, I am running a company. I'm a managing director of the company, uh, uh, and it's a multinational company. Uh, any dispute arises, and uh, at the time when the dispute arises, I do not have a sufficient uh, financial condition by which I can bear the expenses of the of the arbitration proceedings. So what I do, I may request to the third party to fund my arbitration procedure, right, internationally. And if I win certain percentage, apart from the amount which you give, certain percentage would be given to you. So that's called a third party, right? So here, what I say is here in the second point, involved directly or indirectly into the process right those people can give a better answer right of that question by saying that whether the arbitration process uh, it's going to be changed the, uh, after this COVID-19 situation but before that what I feel that we will see that what exactly the arbitration process uh, uh, is exist right and then we will think about after this period uh, 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 after this period, uh, COVID-19, how arbitration process uh, going to be influenced, right? So uh, this is for that purpose, I prepared uh, this particular slide. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now before I move on uh, about the existing arbitration procedure or a process and a process, refresh your memory. Uh, importance of ICA today, uh, as I said, that um, uh, it's very catchy um, uh, arbitration process. Uh, but the important part here in practical aspect is that um, uh, ICA today in India, if you see, uh, 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 it has been, you can find it, there are, uh, there are three different, one act and two amendments. Uh, uh, we generally recognize it that the existing arbitration act, that is the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 
1996. Uh, the main feature of this act uh, is that it includes two things, practically. One is about the domestic arbitration uh, and international commercial arbitration provisions. And at the same time, the second part, which speaks about the enforcement of foreign arbitral award. Now, a uh, one uh, small distinction here, because we generally uh, understand that enforcement of foreign arbitral award and international commercial arbitration, I repeat, international commercial arbitration and enforcement of foreign arbitral award, both are same. No, both are not same. International commercial arbitration, as I said, that definition is party centric. When you may find that out of the two parties to the arbitration, one party is other than India, it means that the one party is belongs to India and another party is other than India. Same provisions of part one, it's going to apply in the international commercial arbitration, which otherwise recognized as a domestic arbitration, right? So this is one. Only the once the award. Uh, and and second thing, second thing, uh, this first part of the 1996 Act, uh, it, it's going to apply at the time when the parties, maybe uh, one it's from United Kingdom, a big company, and another company it's from incorporated according to the Indian Companies Act, so it becomes an Indian company, and they have entered into the contract. And after entering into the contract, they have an arbitration clause by saying that in future, and it is it would be it would be resolved by an Indian Arbitration Act 1996, for example. So it means that it's an arbitration, parties agreed on arbitration. This is an international commercial arbitration. And at the time when the dispute arises, Mr. Arbitrator, it's going to read the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996, right? So what I trying to make you understand is that the first part of the 1996 Act, though it recognizes as a domestic arbitration where both the parties are Indian parties, it equally applying in the international commercial arbitration when the parties one party from India and another party it's other than India, they have chosen the Indian arbitration law, right? This is first part. Second part, which I said, it's about the enforcement of foreign arbitral award, which is different. Enforcement of foreign arbitral award, I just give an illustration of it. For example, is that uh, uh, one party belongs to India, one company it belongs to India, incorporated with the Indian Companies Act 2013 and another it's from the uh, it's from the United States of America and you let's say that's about Brazil for example or any state that you may find into the uh, uh, Latin America uh, why I say this because Latin Americans mostly recognizes the ancestral model law which we have recognized it so if you see that these two parties one it's from India, another it's from other than India. It's a perfect match of ICA. But if both the parties have chosen the laws of arbitration is other than India or laws of contract is other than India, right? And, and that award which has been passed based on the laws other than India wants to enforce in India, right? So if they wants to enforce in India, that would be governed by the part two of the 1996 act. I repeat this, I repeat this. Uh, those who could not concentrate it, just concentrate on. What I say that the second part of the 1996 act in the arbitration procedure is different than the ICA. I give example, once again, the same illustration if you have any questions, just write down onto it. So lastly, I can take up the questions. One party, it's from India. Another party is from other than India, right? 
and they entered into the contract and they had an arbitration a perfectly fine till that you can recognize the situation as i said it's an international commercial arbitration right but now that is possible when both the parties have taken both the parties have opted the indian law and then according to the indian arbitration and conciliation act the arbitration process arbitration procedure would be conducted but if they have chosen the laws these two parties one from india and another from other than india they have chosen the laws which laws laws it's laws governing the arbitration agreement one law governing the contract or a curial law if they have chosen other than india and that award based on the laws other than india the arbitrator followed and he has passed an award but since one part it's it's from india and he wants and he has won the case the arbitration arbitration went in favor of him and he wants to enforce that award in india then the uh, part 2 of the 1996 act would be applicable which says the nomenclature the heading of the part 2 of the 1996 act it says about the enforcement of foreign arbitral award right and then uh, accordingly the part 2 would be uh, uh, would be followed and part 2 says nothing if i if i go with the practical aspect part 2 is nothing it's not that much uh, difficult to understand as how the part 1 is also very easy part 2 says that if any award which has been passed if subject matter has not been recognized by an in by an indian legislatures definitely that award it's not going to be enforced so if it goes against the public policy of india so and and and, and there are three grounds in fact we will see that it's on the later stage but uh, unless uh, you know the award which they the indian party receive and uh, after receiving he wants to enforce in india unless it's uh, against the public policy there is no major reasons for the courts not to enforce that particular award in india right so uh, this is the main act uh, second am first amendment uh, that is in 2015 right uh, uh, first amendment 2015 and the second amendment is 2019 right so you may find uh, there is in um, uh, one act 1996 act and then first amendment in 2015 and then second amendment that is in 2019 2019 amendment uh, which speaks about the and more concentration uh, it's on institutional arbitration rather than the ad hoc arbitration and we as in india uh, indian parties generally Uh, if there is a domestic arbitration uh, generally we are choosing as a party an ad hoc arbitrator um, uh, we are not much uh, uh, you can say that uh, acquainted with the uh, pro, uh, with the institutional arbitration and that's why uh, 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 2019 uh, amendment uh, which focuses more on institutional arbitration and you will be surprised i just remember uh, you will be surprised that uh, even if we as an india um, an indian party uh, party is recognized as a, recognizes as an more or pro uh, ad hoc arbitration but uh, 2018 report of the siac siac that is singapore international arbitration center uh, you may find almost around uh 60 percentage uh of the indian parties they right, they have approached out of total number of cases decided by the siac in 2018 60 percentage of cases decided by siac of indian parties so now which you can say that on one side i said and it's imaging it says that research says that uh, we as an indians Are, are are giving less emphasis on uh, institutional arbitration and giving more uh, emphasis on ad hoc arbitration um, but the report of 2018 uh, 60 percentage of the parties uh, 
uh, which the SIAC resolved disputes were from the Indian parties. So you may find that uh, uh, if 2019, it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, 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 effectively implementing, uh, then obviously India may be an hub of the uh, international uh, commercial arbitration. There is no doubt uh, about it. So this is what I just given a brief existing situation. Uh, today, the law regarding the arbitration process and the proceedings, it's about uh, uh, 1996 Act, First Amendment, then 2015, and Second Amendment, then 2019. Uh, second point, which I said, valued-based consultancy and advisory. You and me as a faculty uh, can also uh, have a consultancy, uh, have an as, uh, advisory as well. Apart from our regular assignments, generally with the universities we have. Now the third point, which which is which I have written, I just want to give in clarity on that. Just refreshing your memory on that. Uh, this so-called ICA uh, is an at the end of the day, it's an adjudication. And uh, adjudication, it means that uh, they are deciding something at the end of the day. Arbitrator is deciding. Uh, you can say uh, that it's a quasi judicial. Um, uh, but at the same time, let me give you an practical aspect. Uh, arbitrator, it's nowhere it's going to interpret the law. Let me give you clarity. Uh, though he, he can be considered, the, the award which passed by an arbitrator can be considered can be considered as an adjudication or a quasi-judicial function did by an arbitrator. Perfectly fine. But he is not going to interpret any law per se. He is going to analyze the facts. And those analyses and the acts of the parties are according to the laws or not, which the parties have chosen. I repeat. If you have any doubt on that, you can ask me at the later stage. Note down your question. I repeat this. Though it's a quasi-judicial body, I'm not hesitating to say that, that this is a quasi-judicial body, perfectly fine. But nowhere, Mr. Arbitrator, it's going to interpret the law the way that the court of law interprets it. So you cannot say that it's an uh, it's a substitute to the court. It's an alternative method of resolving the disputes. It's not an alternative method to interpret the law and set the law. For example, if I say that the Supreme Court made a law, the answer is yes. But if you're asking me, Mr. Arbitrator, is going to make a law, my answer would be negative. It's not an affirmative, right? So. It's not a substitute to the court of law. It's an assisting, this process is assisting, right, to the court of law by analyzing the facts, analyzing based on the facts, the claims and the evidences, right, that presents by the parties, and those acts which are committed in the issues and the conditions of the contract are according to the laws or not. Now, when I use word laws, let me give you one clarity. Which, whether it's according to the laws or not. So for me, what do you mean by laws? That's to understand first. Uh, in arbitration, there are three different laws applies. I concentrate uh, on these three different laws. Let me give uh, 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 the category. There are three different laws. And on one hand, I said laws is not going to be interpreted, right? So keep in mind that. And you must have a question on that, I bet. Three laws, Mr. Arbitrator, is going to apply, irrespective of whether it's an ad hoc arbitration or institutional arbitration, no matters. First, law governing the arbitration agreement, which the parties have chosen. So if I say, that parties have chosen Indian Arbitration Act, parties have chosen London Court of International Arbitration and then London Court of Arbitration. They have also 1996 Act. Parties have chosen the Philippines Arbitration Act. 
right parties have chosen the pakistan arbitration act right so uh, it means what it means what that the parties have chosen so far as the proceedings the first word in the first slide proceedings are concerned right the parties have chosen the law of x country right so you can say that uh, parties have chosen the laws governing the arbitration agreement is of pakistan or is of bangladesh or is of philippines or is of sri lanka or is of brazil or is of united kingdom x countries law governing the arbitration agreement because every domestic law of every state every domestic arbitration law of every state is based on the unsuitable model law so you do not find the arbitration laws of different countries are vary in terms of procedure i repeat why it is not so because every domest every country's domestic arbitration act that how we have our act 1996 you may find the similar provisions which we have in every country's domestic arbitration so for example if you may find here that the appointment of an arbitrator of section 11 of indian arbitration act 1996 same provisions right with the different numbers of the sections it may be 10 or it may be a 12 because we have 11 you may find the similar provisions into the into the into the pakistan or a sri lanka or a china's domestic arbitration why i say this it's because the unsuit all countries including civil law countries and the common law countries majority of the states right they have recognized the unsuit model law right united nations international trade commission's law so you, and because of that's the umbrella and because of that unsuitable every state right have their own domestic law but the guiding principles on the provisions it's of unsuitable right so keep in mind this so what happens that if the parties have chosen uh, the law three laws i would, i was i was referring three laws which applies in the in the arbitrations irrespective of whether it's an ad hoc or institutional or irrespective of whether it's a domestic or uh, uh, international so the first law is law governing the arbitration agreement arbitrator has to follow second law and second law is law governing the contract it means that it means that uh, the parties when they entered into the contract for example it's an import and export or an transfer technology contract or you can say the constructions of the highways and as given to for example the government of india has entered into the contract uh, uh, they have entered into the contract uh, with the government of philippines or with the private party of the philippines uh, and in which they have arbitration clause and in they say that law governing the arbitration agreement would be of philippines law governing the contract would be of philippines right so whenever any dispute arises what is the role here of the arbitrator by looking this law governing the contract saying that all the principles of the of the contract of philippines whether the parties have followed or not and if there is a breach of the contract whether it is uh, as per the provisions of the philippines contract act or not if it is not obviously the award it's going to pass in favor of other right so that's why they are reading they are not interpreting it so this is the second law first law is the law governing the arbitration agreement right second it's that law governing the contract and the third law it says about the curial law uh, that's curial law or a procedural law right and that curial law will come at the time if there is a, a institutional arbitration institution should have their own law right how to conduct an arbitration process procedure that you may find law governing into the arbitration act but here the process 
and Francesca example, which I had given earlier, that for example, uh, uh, if the arbitrator is sending a notice to a defendant, uh, he will write into the notice that he expect that within a seven days, right, he, he, the, the defendant would give a reply. So where it is written that seven days, which I said, though it's a discretionary power of the arbitrator, of Mr. Arbitrator, that seven days time is suffice based on the location, based on the um, uh, technology that they are using it, based on the subject matter, if it is very complicated, then would be given more number of days to a defendant to respond on the, right? So in, based on that, this discretionary power which the arbitrator exercises, neither it is written into the act, that is 1996 act, or any other domestic act or unsuitable, nor it is written into the law governing the contract, but it must be written either if there is an institution, then institutional rules, that is called curial law. And if there is an ad hoc arbitration, then the unsuitural rules. So the second nomenclature is unsuitural rules. And what I said earlier that the umbrella, that's the unsuitural law, right? So arbitration 1996 act, for example, is based on the unsuitural law. But when it comes to the curial law, that is a curial, uh, uh, curial law, that's the unsuitable curial law 1985, right? So in that way, uh, three different uh, laws that the arbitrator is following. Now, interesting point here uh, is that uh, 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 that in international commercial arbitration, when one party is other than India and they want that uh, um, uh, the law governing the arbitration agreement would be India, but law governing the contract and the curial law, uh, law governing the contract is of other than India, and then curial law based on the institution which they have chosen. So it is possible and quite possible that all these three different laws, which parties have an autonomy in fact to choose the laws, right, may be of three different countries, right? Uh, but generally, generally, uh, uh, if the parties have chosen the laws of contract of X country, uh, generally the party are very smart and obviously no party wants to make any kinds of hurdle during the arbitration process. So they will choose generally all these uh, two laws of the same country. And if they have chosen the institution, institution, um, after reading carefully the institution's rules, they will follow accordingly. Uh, why I say this? Because uh, the problem arises in adjudication in ICA uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, the, the curial law, uh, the institutions um, have options also because all the time you cannot find in the ICA that both the countries are, are common law countries and both the law countries are civil law countries. Uh, uh, difficult task for an arbitrator in institution arbitration is at the time uh, when one party is from common law country and another it's from civil law country. Why I say this and what difficulty is, see the system of the common law country system to adjudicate the matter of the common law country like India has a difference is different than the civil law country. Uh, uh, for example, what happens uh, we have an adversarial system. So what happens, I just giving practical example of it so you can understand it properly. Suppose uh, uh, the witnesses are called for, right? Uh, now uh, in adversarial system, what we do, the common law countries do, that based on the depositions of the witnesses written by, and uh, based relying on that uh, depositions under the affidavits, uh, the exhibits of that particular deposition would take place. Uh, while this is not our practice in the civil law countries, when they are taking and relying on the evidences, they are inquisitorial. So what happens that if any doubt raises by an arbitrator, right, he will ask from the parties to submit a document on the same, instead of relying completely on the affidavit that what generally the common law countries believes on. Right, so uh, the difficult task in the arbitration process, or you can say the procedure 
uh, applies at the time uh, when one party or a council or the advisors like you and me are from common law country and then from other party other parties advisor that's from a civil law country right so uh, that's why the adjudication is a one word which i have written but it's very very complicated when it comes with the um, uh, with the uh, practice the ica okay uh, so i hope that you have refreshed your memory i just given you an uh, uh, you know idea may i request an uh, next slide please okay uh these are the uh, uh um, pro procedure it's not process now in every state's domestic arbitration every state's majority of the state which states i'm referring those states who have signed and ratified the unsuitable model law and as i said around 70 percentage of the states out of 193 states across the globe 70 percent of the states who are the parties to the unsuitable model law there are few states in the united states of america they are not a party to the unsuitable model law that's why i was very careful when i given an example of brazil and then other states you may take up in the latin america so there are there are there are few states who are in the americas who are not a party to the uh, to the unsuitable model law so i'm not i'm not questioning on that uh, majority of the domestic arbitration in majority of the jurisdictions you may find this is a sequence it's nothing new and there is not don't surprise by reading all these points easily you can find out in our own domestic arbitration act 1996 why i said this it's because generally this kind of issues on which in practice in practice in practice is arises arbitration agreement definition of arbitration i'm not least bothered about theory i more concentrate on the practical area three things uh, that in practice we have to understand when we are reading the arbitration agreement suppose you are a party i'm just giving you an example i don't have a sufficient time uh, and i will not go fast certainly not but i make sure that what i explain you should understand that thoroughly now uh, provisions like arbitration agreement that you may find in every domestic arbitration act composition uh, of the tribunal it may be one it may be three so that should not be uh, you know even number right that's why if there is no even number the logic is that then majority of the of the members of the tribunal may pass the award so it should be one three five seven and nine instead of to go with the two four six so that's why the composition of an arbitral tribunal uh, then a jurisdiction of the tribunal uh, 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 section 16 uh, just giving you a rough idea about uh, section 16 it speaks about a jurisdiction of a tribunal and which says that uh, the party raised a question to an arbitrator says that you do not have a jurisdiction since the subject matter is not for example um, uh, 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 is civil in nature or subject matter which is in the dispute the parties have they have never agreed that kind of issues would arbitrate so it's an outside the scope of an arbitrator and that's why mr arbitrator you do not have a jurisdiction into it so such kind of arguments by the councils that you may find uh, you know entertained by the uh, by the tribunal or an arbitrator in the name of jurisdiction conduct of arbitral proceedings right uh, uh, so conduct of arbitration proceedings. Yeah, Tripathi Jaiswal. Uh, I will. I will let you know, uh, Jaiswal. Uh, conduct of arbitral proceedings. Uh, and here it's not process; it's proceedings, right? Uh, Et capital E and capital T is nothing but equal equal treatment to the parties. E E stands with equal. T stands with the treatment. So it's an equal treatment to the parties. Then rules of procedure. Ah, this is very important point. Uh, rules of procedure. It means it's nothing but in practice it says that so far as the civil procedure code and the evidence, like evidence law, is concerned, uh, they are optional for an arbitrator to follow. 
uh, and here optional it means what otherwise sending or issuing a summons by an arbitrator to a party or a witness is nothing but the cpc generally they follow uh, they are calling witness and then depositions exhibits by an arbitrator in the arbitration procedure is nothing but a procedure for those according to the evidence act but here the rules of the procedure into the domestic arbitration act says that it is not binding to follow very strictly that how otherwise the court of law follows right so no strictness so far as the civil procedure code and the uh, and the uh, evidence act is concerned and this rule you may find in every every jurisdictions in every domestic arbitration of every states right who are the parties to the unsuitor because this guidelines it has been adopted by the unsuitor model law so what it says and 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 and, and unless this flexibility lies with the arbitrator he cannot expedite the procedure right so obviously uh, it's an optional optional for what option is not for to follow or not to follow option is to strictly follow or not to strictly follow right so that's that's here the difference is so rules of procedure that the party is chosen for example for example if you go to the cpc cpc says that written statement by mr defendant has to submit within 90 days right and if there is no 90 days the specific reason would be given by a defendant and if the court thinks fit the adjournment or extension can be given to a defendant this is what that that stage has to be followed all this stage would be followed by the court of law that is a strict cpc requires to be followed by a trial court but when the same situation comes to an arbitration arbitrator might say that it's 90 days it, instead of 90 days i'm going with the 30 days i'm going and based on the technology which they use right so if there is an email for example right an email has been sent within a fraction of seconds and then then reading it within a day and then can reply it very well so instead of to waste time to say is that follow strictly follow the 90 days right it's better that you can go with the seven days and seven days replies further extension requires without hesitation it can be given a further extension to the parties by an arbitrator so so that flexibility um, uh, can be called as a party autonomy or can be called that it comes under the uh, arbitration procedure uh, uh, very easily right so that's the rule of the uh, procedure uh, plus um, commencement language claims uh, hearing written uh, that is ws is nothing but hearing on the written statements uh, then default and then experts uh, opinion and other things default it's dismissed for default section 25 of the 1996 act uh, claim and defenses as generally we can see in the cpc in arbitration we can see under section 24 um, sub clause 1 and 24 sub clause 2 also we can see uh, commencement is section 11 section 20 is a place of arbitration now one point here in the in the fourth point i'm reading which you can see on your slide in a fourth point my focus is now on place of arbitration uh, i will take five minutes because my time it's going to be over uh, uh, the place of arbitration it's very complicated issue in the arbitration procedure uh, there are two words in ica uh, one is uh, uh, says that uh, seat of arbitration uh, and another is a place of arbitration now if you see the indian arbitration act 1996 uh, you may find section 20. Mm, i request uh, uh, participants can open on side uh, the arbitration act 1996 also so you can easily refer the act right uh, so what happens that section 20 that says about place of arbitration now in i there is a difference between these two words seat of arbitration is always when you are using word seat in ica it always remains juridical now what do you mean by juridical juridical it means that if the parties for example have chosen the seat they use words seat and uh, that seat is for example england 
so even the parties not writing anything regarding the uh, specific law to be to be applied on the on the issues uh, 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 of the arbitrary on the issues or on the disputes since the word seat and seat is england all these two laws that is the law governing the arbitration agreement and the law governing the contract of england would be followed right so that's called seat and that's called juridical in nature so seat always in ica that's the international commercial arbitration remains juridical while place is not as such place for example for example parties have chosen the seat is england and for the and since if both the parties are business personals for the convenience sake uh, they have uh, uh, conducted an arbitration proceedings in india and that is to in indore right so since they have conducted arbitration proceedings for the convenience sake in indore the indian law is not going to apply since the parties have written and agreed that the seat of arbitration is england so mr arbitrator by sitting in in in, in the district indore they have to read the law of england that is the law governing the contract and the law governing the arbitration agreement and third law is a curial law procedure if mr arbitrator has been appointed by an institution then arbitrator will follow the institutional rules if he has been appointed by the parties as an ad hoc then obviously the unsettled model law than the 1996 act is there so unsettled rules would be applicable so far as the curial law is concerned so in that way place the word place is very important here and what we are reading it's a proceedings right it's not process it's proceedings uh, making an arbitral award and then termination um uh, then recourse against you know what let me give you one clarity um recourse and then appeals also i have written if you see second last point is appeal right and the fourth from last fourth point uh, is recourse against an arbitral award right so recourse is not challenge it's not appeal it's a challenge right appeals in arbitration the, uh, if the final award has been passed right no law right of arbitration agreement allows to file an appeal right i repeat and i emphasize two words you should not be unnecessarily be confused if the final award passed by an arbitrator and you and 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 the party is not agreed with it right uh, he cannot file an appeal against that award because appeal is a repetition right uh, entire process which conducted by the uh, during the trials so there is no appeal but recourse that is under section 34 of the arbitration and conciliation act or an unsettled uh, model law 34 it says about recourse you can challenge it and when you are challenging on the specific grounds only right you are allowed to challenge that award which passed by an arbitrator right only those four grounds four grounds which are written under section 34 right for example against the public policy this is the first ground uh, second ground i can say uh, uh, that is about if the arbitrator has not followed the procedure that is the proceedings which you can see here right and the on the fourth point if he has not followed according to the agreement of the party right third that if the subject matter right it's not been Uh, submitted by either of the parties to him right uh, so um, uh, 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 so according to it recourse is of only four grounds that you can challenge an award it's not an appeal appeal is under section 37 uh, of the 1996 act and which speaks about um, uh, the appealable orders right that is Uh, under section 9 if the court has passed an interim award uh, interim order then you can challenge it right if under section 16 you can challenge it 
right? There are four clauses on which you can challenge um, this, but not appeal is not allowed against the final award passed by an arbitrator. Uh, there are curial, uh, some institutions which have a curial laws um, uh, and in curial laws, they have, a, they have a rule that before the, uh, once the arbitrator or tribunal passed an award, it would go for the scrutiny. For example, SIAC rule 2016, it has a rule. Uh, that rule says that once the tribunal passes an award, before making any award, uh, uh, before it's pronounced, there must be undergo the scrutiny. And what is the meaning of the scrutiny? It says that no technical error. Uh, obviously, they are not going to question on, in, on any merits, but that committee scrutinizes it that any technical error is exist or not. And if there is no technical error, obviously, then it would be pronounced. And this mechanism, this good institution, arbitration institutions have kept it, it's because of their own benefit, because it should not have happened that the uh, very reputed institution has passed an award. And when it went to the court for the enforcement, domestic court for the enforcement, it has been refused to enforce it uh, based on the technical ground or the grounds mentioned, right, uh, into the section 34, right? So, and obviously then it would be a stigma for that institution. That's why they have a uh, curial law in that curial law they have a mechanism that the scrutiny of an award that scrutiny is not an appeal as i said it's it's not at all going to deal with anything on merits it's purely purely on technical aspects right so uh, there is a difference when you read the last fourth point Uh, it seems that there is some network issue uh, uh, at Dr. Gandhi's end. Let's just be a little patient. I'm sure he'll log on very soon. We have spoken to sir, he'll be rejoining the meeting very soon. Please be patient. Uh, in the meanwhile, if you have any questions, you can write them down in the chat box. After yeah, sir. I have reconnected. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay, sir. Are you done with your address, sir? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, last point. I could not finish the entire thing in one hour. Uh, uh, enforcement of okay, two things here. Uh, just want to make it out. Um, and last point, which I say is enforcement of certain uh, foreign awards uh, that covers under article un under Part Two of the 1996 Act. And the majority of the, in practice, the majority of the awards, foreign awards are challenging uh, under the uh, terms of public policy, under the terms of public policy. Uh, that, uh, 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 that's the only concern that nowadays for India as well, uh, how to become a pro-arbitration or arbitration friendly uh, state. We are doing wonderful so far, uh, 2019 act uh, is concerned and we are waiting that uh, ACI, that is the Council, uh, Arbitration Council of India, uh, would be composed or instituted very soon to, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to um, uh, give accreditation to an individual and to the institutions in the uh, upcoming years. So thank you very much. This is from my side. 
uh, so far as uh, these things are concerned, arbitration. Uh, two points, one point last, uh, uh, post COVID-19 situation would be different on two aspects. Uh, difficult tasks nowadays for the law firms, uh, arbitration law firms is that uh, when the stage is about the collect the deposition from the witnesses and cross examination of witnesses, at that point of time, it's uh, uh, the presence uh, in person is very essential instead of virtual, uh, which we are, uh, which uh, obviously the uh, arbitrators and the clients and the councils are facing. Uh, because uh, 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 who is cross-examining that council wants to see the faces of face of, uh, of all witnesses uh, and the question in the cross-examinations when it has been asking uh, it has to see the uh, you know the reaction also when the question is throwing by the council to a witnesses so this is the problem um, uh, so even if it's so cheaper the virtual arbitration process is so cheaper but at the time when it comes for the cross-examination of the witnesses, uh, it creates, um, uh, 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 you know, the problem for the council. This is one. Uh, and the second is that uh, even if it is cheaper, uh, parties uh, at the time when uh, they, are, uh, they have oral arguments, uh, apart from the written submissions, in oral arguments also, the, the arbitrators and the tribunal prefers that it would be in person. It's because they can ask directly the questions at the time when the argument's going on. I'm talking about final arguments when it's going on based on the submissions of the evidences and the documents and the exhibits by the, those documents by the arbitral tribunal. So in this two context, a post COVID-19 situation um, uh, uh, um, may, may see uh, in a different way, right? On these two stages, otherwise it's, virtual it's very cheaper uh, but in international arbitration when common law country and civil law countries are against each other uh, virtual hearing and the cross examination of witnesses might have a difficult uh, time in future so this is from my side um, thank you nakul singh is waiting um, that when i conclude i know no, no, uh, thank sir. you i can abide with the timing sir. So, no, it's okay. Yeah, I understand because I also conduct such kind of seminars. So I understand that. No problem. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, uh, wonderful words. Uh, we'll just move on to the question and answer session for a bit. Yes. And then uh, I would pass on the virtual mic to my colleague, uh, Professor Rasubriya. So, uh, so one of the questions, uh, I, I think that you saw the question as they came and, you know, you tried to address them with, uh, in between uh, your address. But one of the questions that you were uh, unable to answer at that time uh, has been posted and the question is, in the recent trends, we can see that many companies which are incorporated under Companies Act 1956 and Companies Act 2013 are dealing in financial activities after the approval of RBI. These companies grant loans mm -hmm. to the public and the contract between them have arbitration clause. Generally, Arbitrators are the are biased towards the companies, and we can see the misuse of arbitration clause and the beneficiary clause. Uh, beneficiary companies do settlements. In such situation, loaner yeah. is helpless. The person who gives the loan is helpless. What is your take on this? Uh, yeah. Uh, so far as the misuse of the arbitration clause, I give a simple example. Uh, I also face the some um, on some other days. Uh, for example, Section 8, once you have a valid arbitration clause, you do not have any option except to accept the arbitration process. So, uh, and at the time, uh, when, if you have a doubt, for example, you are, you are, you are counsel of the company and the other, the other company who has not been that much influenced on it, you can very well question on Section 12, that is the, uh, uh, the arbitrators against the arbitrator himself. Right, section 12, grounds of challenge, right? That is under section 12, uh, you can challenge, ground on challenge that the behavior of Mr. Arbitrator or a tribunal, right, raising certain doubts. And if raising certain doubts, if you have evidences, you can very well provide those evidences to the court of law. Obviously, first opportunity, you have to raise those doubts against himself, that is against the arbitrator himself. Obviously, he's going to reject your doubts, right? So what happens that you can file an appeal against that order, which passed by an arbitrator. 
but our act is in such a way that you have to wait till the final award passed by an arbitrator so you have to tolerate the attitude of an arbitrator till the award passed because then only you can challenge under section 34 you don't have interim interim relief during the arbitration process that you can challenge to an arbitrator point of time right so section 12 challenging that is the grounds of challenge section 13 1313 that is the challenging procedure and if you are still remain aggrieved after the order passed by a tribunal says that no i'm not biased for example i am an arbitrator i says i'm not biased i continue with the arbitration proceedings you do not have any option at that point of time but certainly when i pass a final award you can go under section 34 challenging right under the section 34 which is one of the grounds of the uh, under section 34 that you can very well uh, take an action against i hope i answered the question thank you sir uh, this question was from rahul i hope uh, rahul your doubt has been solved by sir resolved by sir uh, sir i yeah think... rahul mentioned yeah it's yeah, satisfied yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, sir the other two questions i think you have already addressed while speaking okay so, uh, what we can do right now is we have another 5 minutes for the question answer session if okay. anybody wants to ask anything to sir you can raise your hand and i will unmute that particular person you so that you can have a direct interaction with sir so if anybody wants to speak to sir uh, regarding any query or any doubt or just want to share your experience with the session you can raise your hand and i will unmute that particular person okay so we have a hand raised from twinkle uh, Twinkle, I've allowed you to speak. Uh, you have to unmute yourself now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to ask if, uh, I mean, as you said that what the arbitral proceeding and, uh, you know, while moving it online, it is difficult for, uh, you know, the cross-examination of witness and everything. But apart right. from that, what will, do you think that there'll be any impact on the arbitral award if that is given in such a situation if the arbitration was online? Oh, it's a, a tremendous effect it's going to be. Uh, it's because if the cross-examination is not properly taken up or could not properly taken up. For example, it happens. I want to see as a council, and generally in international commercial arbitration, council wants that, that I want to see that who is sitting nearby, uh, the witness to whom I cross-examine virtually. He wants to see every corner of the faces of, an, uh, of a witness. Right, his go who is going to whether anyone is going to assist him or not. So if I am not being able virtually to focus that because I want to see the gestures of a witness also when I throw a question in cross examination. So if I could not see that, I may not probably I may not ask the very next question more effectively and may not be you know get an answer which I expected before I asked the questions to and cross uh, to the witnesses. So it's going to be a tremendous effect if it's continued. And obviously, if the one party raise an objection not to have a virtual cross-examination, uh, arbitrator generally have, you know, accept that. Um, uh, that, okay, fine, we can have in person. Only the thing is that the cost need to be paid by both the parties is time. Because time, it's time consuming. So in that, and obviously the party don't, party prefer that even if it is time consuming, I want that now to, you know, in person the cross-examination. And if it is allowed, certainly it's going to be effect directly on the final awards going to be passed by an arbitrator. Okay, but this is when we are talking with respect to arbitrations between two parties in the same country. But yeah. when it it comes cross border arbitration uh, comes mm. to cross border arbitrations, mm. does the same thing apply? Because when I'm talking, I mean, looking into the current situation, like mm. uh, the current pandemic, yeah. traveling and everything across the country has also become difficult. Not yeah. even say we're restricted within the country itself, but even yeah. outside the country, it's uh, pretty restricted. So mm. whether uh, uh, I mean, according to you, uh, you know, the arbitration proceedings will reduce uh, considerably looking into these circumstances or, uh, you know, uh, it will remain intact and the virtual proceedings uh, as going on right now will continue, no, but no, there no. will be an impact on the arbitration award no, no. or arbitral what award. What you say is very theoretical. In practice, what happens to big giant companies involved into the dispute? Uh, and uh, specifically, they are not abide with the timings that how otherwise we are abide with the domestic arbitration says that within 12 months, you have to complete, you have to complete and pass an award. So now what happens that when two big companies and crores and thousands of, of crores rupees are involved into it, they prefer the time may be consumed 
but they don't prefer that it would be virtually continued. Right? And it depends on in specifically when there is a multi-party arbitration agreement and uh, multi-party transactions are in disputes because it's not one country's uh, finances involved into it. It's more than one country's or two countries' finances has been involved into it. And then very serious issues arises when there is a third party funding. When it comes third party funding, because the party also need to take an advice of the third party. If he is funding for the, your arbitration proceedings, so you have to ask them also, because whatever the, uh, uh, the, the, the decision of the court would be uh, monetary, he is also going to be affected at the end of the day. So in ICF, two billions, uh, if two parties and billions of amounts involved, involved into the subject matter, they prefer, even if it is after six months, the cross-examination would take place. They say, oh, I'm very much fine. After, even after six months, I don't want to lose my award in any way. Right? So it's not only losing and uh, winning. Uh, there are certain uh, indirect benefits also they, they may get, right? To make, uh, uh, you know, uh, cross-examination not virtually, but in person, right? I hope I've okay. given an answer to Inkar. Okay, thank you. thank you. Let's take one last question. Uh, Ujwala has posted a question, sir. And the question is how right to access to justice is ensured during pandemic time, particularly international, when, particularly when international arbitrators are involved? Uh, well, uh, if the parties are happy to have a virtual uh, uh, hearing and virtual arbitration procedure. Uh, for example, in our days, every institutions have their own curial law, which specify that if the parties cannot or a council cannot remain in person uh, presence, obviously by virtually. So uh, nowadays they are utilizing this time uh, because they have their own rules. For example, SIAC 2016, they have a rule. ICC has a rule. Uh, Hong Kong uh, Center has a rule uh, about the virtual hearing. So you won't find much uh, the difference. Uh, it depends on the subject matter, in fact, uh, how complex the subject matter is and uh, how much amount has been involved into that particular dispute and how this award is going to be affecting the future relationship uh, between the parties and the countries sometime as well. So um, uh, yeah, they are, uh, nowadays awards are passing virtually. But again, uh, there are parties also who raise in question, it's about the, uh, the jurisdiction, right? So that's also comes uh, into the picture. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for answering our questions. Thank I you. now uh, pass on the virtual mic to my colleague, uh, Professor Ritupia Gotu, to propose a vote of thanks. Okay. On behalf of Department of Law, Prestige Institute of Management and Research, I thank Dr. Gandhi, sir, for giving such a valuable input on the arbitration process and proceeding. I am sure all the participants have gained immense knowledge from your session. And thank you, sir, for joining us for our uh, faculty development program. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I request all the participants that you have to, uh, there's a feedback form that would be given to you. Kindly fill all uh, the feedback form and submit it. And the second day uh, schedule of the faculty development program would be given to you uh, on your WhatsApp link. So kindly adhere to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here with us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your time.